morning to the word of God. As we praise God in all the many ways that God comes to us. Let us know the peace that comes from being close to God. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share it with one another. Today's scripture reading will be from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Um, it says, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At the time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of the Lord had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, he said, here am I, and ran to Eli and, he, and said, here am I, for you called me? But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lie down. The, <clears throat> the Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel, get up. And went to, Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. For you called me, but he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet revealed to him, had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lie down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever 
for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall be expedited by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel laid there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide all that he told you. Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Today, <clears throat> we get so much email and voicemail and telemarketing calls and junk mail, advertising that we hardly notice most of it. It is everywhere in our lives. <clears throat> Many folks suffer from what I call busy brain. <clears throat> our minds are running at ADHD levels all the time. We can hardly even sleep because of this assaulting communication. But imagine a time <clears throat> when silence was the greater part of life, like two weeks without the internet or cable in the wilderness. 
You begin to hear the birds and the insects, the fish jumping out of the pond water, trickling streams, wind blowing through trees and tall grass. Our own hearts beating and we hear our own breath so that these become central to our keeping of time. It's into this that we have a chance of hearing God speak to us, just as God spoke to young Samuel. Prophets like Samuel devote themselves to being attentive to God. Often they're the only ones listening. Old Eli and the rest of the hotshots in his day, well, you know what was happening there. They had lost focus on God's vision and words. They were spiritually blind and deaf. They had accommodated their religion to patterns of religion, to economic, social, and political power structures that made the rich and rich and the plundered the rest. And so we see that God speaks to those who are attentive and speaks truth about what's really happening in society. Sometimes God reveals what is about to happen in the future too, but not always. The word that God gives us is always about a reality that most no longer seem to grasp at all. We're too busy-minded and doing life without God's reality, and we don't listen for God or care to align ourselves with God's will. To hear God's communication in some way, we must be willing to break free from the false reality around us, the reality of our own creation. It's a reality of which systems and structures and the order of human life control whatever we experience and accept as true and right. We must be willing to allow ourselves to connect with something else, an alternative reality that is, well, beyond what we already expect. Are you open to such a revelation from God. You may say this is just weird stuff, you know, but recall a time when you thought you understood a situation or of a, another person only to discover you had no accurate idea what the other person was thinking or trying to do. Have you been married? <laughs> Have you been around your children or your parents or a co-worker? This happens all the time to us that we just go, oh, I had no idea what was going on behind your eyes, right? It happens all the time. And that's, that's what prophets break through is that lack of understanding that we have. You could label this, you know, sort of fake news, but... Our spouses never do, right? They always are pretty clear that, oh no, this isn't fake news. This is something you need to know, (laughs) right? And we have friends and coworkers who do the same. These always point to things which are a deeper reality than we were aware of. We discover, you know, that they're below the surface. And they always seem to demand that we change ourselves. This is the most annoying part about God. It's the same problem we have with most of our spouses, (laughs) right? We're expected to change in relationship to a reality that we conveniently have forgotten and ignored. Now, If you were to describe this alternative reality, what happens? You are derided and criticized and maybe even killed as many of the prophets were. Remember that you're describing something that's true because it places the context and behavior of the majority of us into the context of God's will for us. You'll be speaking justice and practical mercy and ways of living together that resonate with the heart of love rather than the the wallet of greed and selfishness. A prophetic calling 
almost invariably demands that we tell people what they most want to deny and hide about themselves. These are things that on a societal level, later historians will uncover, oh gosh, this is what caused this great event in history. Now, World War I is far enough away that probably none of us were around to remember it. The historians now tell us what? That the, the Treaty of Versailles that followed World War I, the rise of Hitler, the isolationism in the United States, the colonial ambitions of the British and the French, all those things and others, and the, the racism and anti-Semitism that was common everywhere in Europe all led to World War II. But if you'd been in America <clears throat> as an adult before World War II, you might have missed it all until Pearl Harbor. Now the same thing happens to us in individuals, as societies, as churches. So the question is, are we willing to go through the unpleasant process of hearing the prophet in our midst. Ingrid's going to talk in a few minutes. She's going to talk about one of the great prophets of the 20, 20th century. For those of you who are old enough, you will remember how unwelcome his words were, how rejected and derided and criticized and demonized he was. So as Christians, we're asked, can we listen to prophetic voice? Can we listen when God calls us to be the prophets?
Amen. You may be seated. Suzanne is unable to um, to offer uh, her words this morning. So if you're looking at the bulletin and watching your clock and going, eh, she's talking too long, I'm not, okay? okay. <laughs> I, I may still be, but um, I am the only speaker this morning. So... Um, <clears throat> And speaking about Martin Luther King Jr. is a daunting task. Um, I will never know what it is like to be a person of color in this country or in any other country. But I do know what it is like to be an immigrant. And I do know what it is like to land in Washington, D.C. in the 1950s and to grow up with the spirit of Martin Luther King in that city. So those are the words, the witness, the vision that I want to express this morning. And I'm going to ask you to do something physical, okay? I'm gonna ask you to breathe in and out three times, and as you do that, silently say, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. So let's be in that silence as we breathe and pray those words. Amen. It is 1958, a beautiful April morning. How old were you in 1958? Or were you not yet born? Were you a minus number, waiting in the wings in God's womb, waiting to make your entrance upon the world stage? Okay. If you were not alive in the 1950s, then by way of entrance into what I'm saying, meld Martin Luther King with Harry Potter. Okay? That's not as crazy as it sounds. Okay? 1958, Washington, D.C. My mother and father and I step off the airplane, having come from a small farming town in Germany, and we stand at the top of those stairs. In those days, you had to walk down onto the concrete and then walk. And your first impression as you're looking around is, oh my God, what a big city, Washington, D.C. What big cars, bluefinned Chevys everywhere. Everything in America is big. We knew growing up in Germany that America is the land paved with gold and full of big things and rich people. And now here we are and we're looking at all of that grandeur. And you sense everything coming in, every sound, every smell, all the people that you see. And one of the first things that you notice as you walk through the airport in Washington, D.C., is that there are white people and there are black people of all different shades. And you notice that the white people are behind counters and have um, nice uh, uniforms or suits or high heels and the black and brown people are doing things like shining shoes or carrying your baggage, or picking up the trash. 
You notice this right away. And you go, huh, what is that all about? And then you look around some more as you get accustomed to this new country and you see that there are maids and they are black and there are people who employ the maids and they are white. And there are people who run elevators and they are black and they address white people as ma'am or miss or sir but they're called by their first names. And then you notice other things. You notice water fountains that say whites only, and other water fountains that say colored. And then you notice front doors and back doors. You notice the front of the bus and the back of the bus. And you begin to wonder, why? And then, as you get to know your way around the city of Washington, D.C., you see that white people live in northwest Washington and some in southeast Washington. But black people live in northeast Washington and southwest Washington. And if you live in Southeast, where we, white German immigrants, lived, you don't ever go as far as Anacostia, okay? Because that's where the black people live, and you just don't go there. Why? Because it's dangerous. Oh. And then one day, okay, this is a hard story to tell. Forgive me, there is a good reason for telling it, okay? One day, we're driving around, and there's the Capitol with an easy view, and all around the Capitol, there are black people who are sitting on the steps or walking up and down the street, and there, it's the middle of the day, and there are children who are not in school, and there are men who are sitting on the stoops, and they're not working, and I said to my aunt and uncle, who were the only people that we knew in America, I, I said, why are those people just sitting there? And my aunt and uncle explained to me that those are not white people. Those are, you fill in the blank, and they don't work hard. They're not ambitious. They're not educated. They can't do things that white people do. And let me tell you, this was delivered not in the nice way that I have just said it to you. And that was my first explicit lesson in racism. I was seven years old, and everything inside me raged. I believe very firmly that we are not born racist. I believe we learn to hate people. And that's what it was. There's no mincing words. You can dress it up, but it was hatred. It was hatred. It was fear. It was ignorance. It was hatred on the part of white people who explained black people to me, a seven-year-old immigrant. So, being the rebellious young child that I was, I really opened my eyes and ears wide. I talked to the maid when she came to clean my aunt's house. Her name was Maud. And she and I would let the parakeet out of the cage and let him fly free. There was great symbolism in that, as I learned much later when I read Maya Angelou. Okay? So Maud and I would let the bird run and walk free while she cleaned the house. 
I had the most incredible English teacher who opened up the world to me. And she was a black woman from Mississippi, Jessie M. Wright. We read not only Maya Angelou, but Richard Wright and James Baldwin and Ralph Ellison and a Langston Hughes and a lot of great poetry. And I began to notice that there were things happening in Washington, D.C., and in fact, all over the world. This was 1958, okay? The uh, the Montgomery bus boycott was in full swing. Rosa Parks wasn't about to give up her seat. This had been long practiced and long rehearsed. Okay. There were children, children, who had the courage to be a part of the first wave of desegregation in Little Rock, Arkansas. There were children who would march, who would pray in a church in Birmingham. And after listening to the sermon and praying, they would walk in Jerusalem just like John. They decided that they had a right to walk the streets of Birmingham. They had a right to sit at the lunch counters and be treated with respect. And we white folks were watching this on television. There were only three channels back then. Everybody watched the same news, more or less, the same pictures. And you saw white people behaving terribly with dogs, attack dogs, with fire hoses turned up full force against children who were walking to the office of the mayor of Birmingham to tell him what it was like to live in a segregated city. And in the middle of all of this, like the center of the fire was Martin Luther King Jr. A man of such profound faith, he knew he was going to die. He knew it. He wrote about it. It had happened actually 10 years before his actual death that he was stabbed by a, a deranged woman in New York City. And the doctor said, had he coughed or sneezed, the knife, the letter opener, I think it was, would have pierced his lungs and he would have been dead. He survived that. His house was firebombed. His brother's house was firebombed. He was told that everybody knew where his children went to school and if he persisted, well. We have so tamed Martin Luther King. Um, it's fine that we celebrate the day by going out maybe and helping in the food pantry or something like that, but we're missing the point, okay? We have to be honest enough as white folks to say that Martin Luther King was hated by many, many People. He was reviled, and his life was constantly under threat. But his faith. He writes that one day when he was particularly discouraged, he sat at the kitchen table praying, saying, how am I going to go on? Another bomb had been tossed. His children had been threatened. You know, the KKK was burning crosses. Civil rights workers were disappearing. And he says that the Lord came to him and promised that he would always be with him, that he would always be with him. And Martin continued to say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. So, 
So a lot of things happened. A lot of changes began, slowly. In my neck of the woods, the swimming pool we used to go to began to be a place where protesters carried signs and said, that black people should be allowed to swim in the same pool as white people, imagine that. The Turkish doctor who lived above us in our apartment building said that this was very wrong, that there were diseases that white people could catch and that was the reason we needed to have segregated pools. Okay. Do you realize how far we've come? Lord knows there is much more to do. Lord knows. But the fact that most white folks can now see racism and go, oh yeah, and go, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of that. Because what Martin Luther King offered was something called the beloved community. He had an antidote to all of this. The beloved community, the Holy Spirit of love. He actually talked about the word love. He actually talked about loving your enemy. He actually talked about praying and blessing those who set the attack dogs and the fire hoses and the police batons against you. He actually proclaimed the Prince of Peace. And amazingly, through his example and his preaching and his prophecy, that vision of a beloved community of all people, black, white, all together, with nothing to fear from each other. It was he who became the lightning rod for all of that. And that's what prophets do. They speak the truth and they say, are you gonna go on the side of hate and violence or on the side of love and justice? That's what said Harry Potter because we don't have a whole lot of prophets. But we need people who stand up at the risk of their very lives and say, which way are you going to choose? And we as Christians really have no choice except the path of love. There's a lot more to say about him. And I will just say very briefly that towards the end of his life, he became much more vocal about the power of nonviolence and the necessity of nonviolence. And we're a long way from hearing that yet. He said, the choice is no longer between violence and nonviolence globally. The choice is between nonviolence or non existence. That's the prophecy that we need to let soak into our hearts because that is the way of Christ resurrected after the crucifixion. So, we thank God for our brother Martin, and we pray that we may have an ounce of his courage and love. Amen.
Good morning. And <clears throat> excuse me. In light of of just hearing what Reverend Ingrid said, um, I just want to say in this season, not just because it's Martin Luther King Day, but every day we should be praying for peace. There's some things that's going on in this world that we probably would never really understand considering the country that we live in. Um, I try not to watch too much of the news, but every now and then I take a peek at it. And every time you take a peek at it, there's something horrible going on somewhere happening. But I know there's more love than destruction, but that's not being reported. Because if they start reporting more love, then that will be more attracting to more people, and then maybe some of the destruction will fall off. So thank you for sharing your story, and sometimes people's personal experiences are the best lessons. So I thank you for that, and let's continue to pray for each other. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray to the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Dieu, nous te rendons grâce. Nous te disons pour cette bonne journée, nous disons merci. Nous savons que notre frère Martin Luther était un prophète. Un prophète qui a lutté pour la liberté des siens. Un prophète qui a lutté pour les qualités. Un prophète qui a lutté pour la bonne vie. Oh Seigneur. Et chaque temps tu choisis les prophètes pour libérer ton peuple. Chaque temps tu choisis les prophètes pour libérer les ethnies. Merci Seigneur. Car aujourd'hui il y a l'égalité. Aujourd'hui il y a la justice. Aujourd'hui, il y a la paix aux États-Unis. Nous prions pour les Congo. Les Congo qui est en train de s'effondrer. Les Congo qui vit une vie horrible. Où il y a les fausses communes. Là, on tue les gens. Oh Seigneur. Il y a un jour, tu te lèveras et tu feras la justice à mon pays. Bénis la parole d'aujourd'hui. Bénis tous les chrétiens dans ces liens. Bénis-nous tous. Nous prions au nom de notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ. Amen.
What a blessing we have. Now let us lift up to God the ways in which we have turned our hearts and minds from God's will and God's way. The ways in which we've become complicit to systems that are hurting other people. Ways in which we have deceived ourselves and hurt others. Trusting in the forgiveness that comes in Jesus' name. Dear friends, know that Jesus loves you and Jesus forgives you and invites you to walk with him. Amen. In his love and grace. So after our prayers together, you're invited to come forward and stand or kneel as you wish to receive. Gluten-free wafers will be on my left, your right. Just ask for them. That's it. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give effects to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, our Alpha and Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us, but made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through prophets and teachers. And in Christ Jesus, your word becomes flesh and dwells among us full of grace and truth. So with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is Jesus who call you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own and fill them with a longing for peace that would last, for justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory, poured out the Holy Spirit upon us, making us a people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took the bread, gave a fancy to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take it, this is my body, which is given for you, do this in your members of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave a thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant put out for you and for many for forgiveness of sins. Do this as you often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on this gift that in breaking of this bread and this drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ, and we are redeemed by the blood, the body and of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ is blood. And as the grain and grapes once dispersed in the field are now united in this table in bread and the fruit of the vine, 
May we and all your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus. The body of God given to us that we might be the body of God in the world. Amen. Amen. And the cup of our salvation. The body and blood of Christ. Okay. All things are ready. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you give yourself to us. Great done may go in the world, strong on your feet, to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, know the love of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this day and every day. Let us go forth and do justice and love mercy and walk with God. Amen.
Really are. 